PFTOT, we do it every weekday to get to things we didn't get to during PFT Live or things we want to talk about a little bit more. We're going to start with something we finished the show with. Sean McVay's somewhat surprising admission that he didn't spend as much time as he needed to preparing for Super Bowl 53 because he spun his wheels in that dead week after the conference championship game studying Patriot film and not and he didn't say this part of it but what he should have been doing we think is studying his own film his own tendencies and coming up with something new is that what you believe he should have done differently that week chris i i do i mean hey he was working hard i think what he's trying to tell us is he prioritized his work a little backwards you know right he got an extra time oh let me just watch every play they've ever done let me just have a million ideas in my head where usually you start to just watch film and you watch a few games okay i got this let me start nailing down a few things how i want to attack that but because of the extra week i think he watched more film and and maybe got a little too inundated with studying New England itself. And to what you're saying or asking me, certainly. I think number one thing you have to do when you play the New England Patriots is self-scout thyself. You have to throw them curveballs. Nobody is more prepared to play against teams' tendencies on a week-to-week -week basis than Bill Belichick and the New England Patriots, especially when they have two weeks to prepare. They're going to be all over all of your bread-and-butter type of football plays. The other reason you have to self-scout thyself Self is because you can't always prepare for what New England's going to do for you, right? Just like we talked about in the AFC Championship game, there's no way the Chiefs would, would have known they were going to come out and double-team Tyree Kill every play of the freaking game and play man-to-man -man across the board. In the, in the Super Bowl, the, the, the Patriots did kind of the same thing. They threw a few plays of zone coverage out there that I don't think Sean McVay was ready for in a, certain, in a few certain formations. But then they also did similar to what they did to Kansas City. They b doubled Brandon Cooks on a lot of big plays and then used some of their other good corners to play man-to-man. -man. You know, Gilmore would match up with Woods and J.C. Jackson would match up with Gerald Everett. So you don't always know what New England's going to do to you until the game starts. So that's why it's even more paramount to study yourself and throw them curveballs because then you can back them off of some of their cute wrinkles that they have brought into the game themselves. I've got a theory that just occurred to me. Maybe it's more of a hypothesis. I never know when a hypothesis becomes a theory. It's a scientific thing. You have to test your hypothesis before it morphs into a theory. Oh. Here's my hypothesis. Mm -hmm. What happened on the Sunday that began the week where Sean McVay was spinning his wheels studying Patriots film and not being as effective and productive as he could have been? What happened that Sunday? Uh, what well, you're saying the Sunday? What you're saying the Sunday that was off? They the won one? the cha They no, oh, no, right. they there won the, the championship yes, right, game. Right, got you. And 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 it was the huge controversy. Sure. At some level, you know, we ne I never thought about it this way. At some level, isn't that distracting Sean McVay? Isn't wondering what people are saying about it? Is our Super Bowl berth tainted? I mean, I know you tell your players, hey, we've earned this. We're going forward. It doesn't matter. But aren't you, when you're in your office and you got the film, you got the big TV up and you got the clicker, but aren't you tempted today? What are they saying about this? Or what, what's going on here? What's this? They're talking about, you know, a lawsuit. They want to replay the game. I mean, I, I'd have to think that part of the week, Sean McVay couldn't help. I know I would. I'd feel like, oh, man, you know, I finally get to the Super Bowl and it's all undermined and marred by this bad call that everybody's complaining about. That's going to take up some of your focus because you're right in the center of it. I, I, and again, I don't I, I'm not making an excuse for him. I'm just saying he had an issue that easily could have distracted him from putting in his work a smart way. Maybe he just kind of went on autopilot and didn't think it through because part of his brain was kicking around all the possibilities of what may happen in the aftermath of the Saints-Rams game. It just, it just yeah. occurred to me, but I think from a human standpoint, how does he not spend some of his time that week thinking about an issue that – that otherwise would have never been an issue. Yeah, no, I, I get you. I'm sure there was a few moments where he turns the TV on or goes to pro football talk and goes, what, you know, what the hell is everybody saying about this game last week? Are they disrespecting us? You know, what kind of controversy are we talking about? I'm sure, but still, I don't think that's the main culprit or anything like that because I just think Sean McVay is such a machine uh, in the way he prepares and can block out noise. I just think it's one of those cases where he looked at it and goes, oh, I got extra time and I'm going 
going to do an extra deep dive. And I think he got a little too deep in the weeds there as far as the Patriots are concerned. And uh, maybe didn't, you know, it was always kind of formulating ideas and this and that. I can do that. And never really hunkered down and got into the nuts and bolts of the game plan maybe uh, until it was a little too late to, to make changes or things that he liked or didn't like as the week goes along and you try them out in practice and things like that. All right, let's move on to the Jason Pierre-Paul situation. We talked Yikes. about it a little bit during the show, but here's the reality. And Look, we, we wish him the best. We hope he recovers quickly. We hope he doesn't need surgery. But if he does have the surgery, he reportedly will miss five to six months. Chris, there are going to be some difficult decisions the Buccaneers have to make from a football standpoint and a business standpoint because – what do you do with Jason Pierre-Paul, who'll be on the non-football injury list at the outset of training camp? Do you put him on the active roster week one, so in the event that that time period for him to recover overlaps with one of those first six games, or do you keep him on non-football injury list, and then you know he's out for at least the first six weeks of the season? You know, the Patriots went through this several years ago with Rob Gronkowski, where he wasn't ready to play, but they put him on the roster in the event he would be ready before week six. And I think he eventually played like week five, maybe even it was week six. But that's going to be a tough decision for the Buccaneers when it comes time to figure out their 53-man roster. And also, if he can't play, do they say, sorry, we're not paying you your $13 million plus salary this year. The team has the right to choose not to pay a guy who can't play due to a non-football injury. And, uh, you know, car accident, I mean, yeah, maybe it depends upon the circumstances. Yeah, was right. he driving recklessly? Yeah. You know, what What? What fault was at play here? But if, if, if you're the Buccaneers, it's going to be very tempting to say if the guy can't play, we're not paying him. Yeah, I, I, I get you. I don't know. I would be interested to see where that falls under a car crash like that. It was a single car wreck, too, if I remember correctly, right? So, yeah, I mean, who's at fault? Does that – can – I don't understand. I don't know the CBA laws and bylaws of that kind of thing. Uh, at the very least, the first point you bring up is interesting too about what you do with them. Do you put them on the pup? Do you put them on the roster? How does it all work out? I think you know. Again, it doesn't sound like they're done with all their evaluations on his neck. But if you think there's a chance that he could possibly come back before week six, I think he's the type of player that you leave him on the roster no matter what and hope he maybe gets there by week four or five. Uh, that would be my play. But this is just—it's an amazing you know, development. Again, for a guy who was very unfortunate with the firework incident and losing a finger or half a finger, or whatever it was, you know, that was a weird, uh, a weird thing and really ultimately led to his demise with the New York Giants. And here we are with another kind of odd, you know, injury or circumstance of injury. And I do feel bad for the Bucks here, a little unlucky. I mean, two weeks after the draft, this happens. You know, they had picked number five. They could have picked Josh Allen, you know, from Kentucky to be the next pass rusher if they knew JPP was going to have this injury and not drafted a Devin White, you know, and, and now here they are stuck with a, a position that wasn't that strong for them to begin with, and now they're going to lose their best player at the position. Uh, certainly hurts the Buccaneers team a lot. Yeah, and if he has that surgery, he'll definitely miss the early part of the season, and that could be enough to to knock the Buccaneers off kilter and make it harder for them to catch up in a very competitive NFC South. All right, we talked during the show about one aspect of the XFL as revealed by a new SI.com article, the possibility that the league won't test for marijuana. Also mentioned in that article, Commissioner Oliver Luck ran into Tim Tebow at the Clemson, Alabama National Championship game, and Luck gauged Tebow's interest in possibly joining the XFL. Tebow said at the time he's committed to baseball, but Chris, he's triple A now. The Syracuse Mets of the International League are his current employer. He's 10 for 30, or as of yesterday, it was 10 for 77, which is a .130 batting average. At what point, if you're Tim Tebow, do you just say, this is never going to work at the level that I want it to. If I ever get to the New York Mets Major League Club, I, I'm, I'm going to be Chris Davis times 10. I'm just not going to be able to hit Major League pitching ever. What, at what point does he say it? At what point should he say it? And then say, you know what? There's a football league out here that wants me to come back and play football. I'm going to go back and do the thing I'm much better at naturally. Yeah, I, I, I know. I mean, uh, what point does he? I, I mean, I would think if it continues the way it's going right now and he's, you know, batting below 100 or even around 100 and baseball season's over, that he might need to reassess what he's doing and realize that there's not going to be like a long-term future or certainly maybe not major league baseball in a few 
future, and he's stuck in the minors for a long, long time. So uh, I would think he's got to make a decision. Again, I don't know if he's worthy of playing quarterback either, but the one thing I can promise you is the guy still has a following, and still people people still love him, and 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 I've never seen anything like it uh, as far as a loyal fan base to one guy. So uh, from the XFL, I understand their interest, and 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 from business standpoint, he is going to drive traffic and get people to come in the stands. But you know, again, I'd still say. Gosh, I'd question him as a quarterback in the XFL, too. You know, again, he's just not but, a guy. But, but what did yeah. we say yesterday? What did we say yesterday? What does the XFL need? No, you're need? right. Stars and, and polarizing figures, and he is that. Exactly right. So he would fit the bill. By the way, we have an update. Last night, Tim Tebow was 0 for 3. His batting average is now .125, so want to be accurate. Damn. Uh, another reason for Tim Tebow to consider possibly giving up on his baseball fantasy and making football a reality all over again. Tebow, a Jacksonville native. Remember, there was buzz he was going to play for the Jaguars. He never did. Telvin Smith does play for the Jaguars, though. And there's been kind of a strange situation with him. He has a long-term contract. The Jaguars don't seem to be happy with him. He hasn't been in off-season workouts. Dave Caldwell, the GM of the team, was evasive uh, to a degree when asked about whether they would trade Telvin Smith. Here's Telvin Smith from Instagram addressing his situation with the Jaguars. Hey, understand this. I've never left Duval. I'm never leaving Duval. It's Duval till we die. You understand me? Y'all seen trade rumors and stuff. Y'all seen me go anywhere? Exactly. Y'all seen the rumors go somewhere, but y'all ain't seen me go nowhere because I ain't going nowhere. You understand me? Look, I understand from his perspective he wants to stay, but... If they want to trade him, they're going to trade him. This is like the reverse Antonio Brown. <laughs> Antonio Brown used social media to get out of Pittsburgh. Telvin Smith is going to use it to try to stay in Jacksonville, but it's not up to him. If the Jaguars want to trade him, if they find a trade partner, then off he goes. And if they just decide they want to cut their losses and move on for whatever reason, off he goes. You know, this may be a leftover of trying to figure out what went wrong last year right. and finding a way to hold some people accountable as they try to move forward more successfully than they were in 2018. Yeah, it's the first thing I thought of. Of maybe, you know, because we've heard the rumors of Telvin Smith, and I thought, man, maybe are they just not happy with the way he acted behind the scenes? I don't know. I will say this. I did see a little bit of a drop in his play last year. I did not think he was the same phenomenal uh, middle linebacker that we've seen in years past. I think, you know, Miles Jack took the crown for the best linebacker on the Jacksonville Jaguars team. I also thought when they drafted Josh Allen at seven, listen, who's the player everybody was comparing Josh Allen to in the NBA and the NFL draft process? It was Anthony Barr a lot of the ways. Anthony Barr was a pass rusher in college who moved up to a stand-up middle linebacker in a 4-3 defense. I wondered if Josh Allen is going to make that switch as well. And if he did, that would mean Telvin Smith, I would think, is in trouble at that position. They can't cut him because they learn that he's $13 million of dead money. So that's not going to happen. If they do find a trade partner, you know, that's one thing. But I think Telvin Smith will be there at least for this year. And then next year, I think there's a chance that maybe he's out the door the dead cap money would be five and a half million dollars next year I think a team could swallow that a lot more if they were unhappy with Telvin Smith at that point he's got a salary of 9.75 million this year five million of it became fully guaranteed on March 17 and he signed through 2021 but those are some big numbers 10 million in 2020 10.25 million in 2021 he may have to agree to a new contract yeah. as part of a trade a lot of moving parts here but you're right a major cap hit for the Jaguars if they move on. And remember, they already took a major cap hit moving on from Blake Bortles. Right. All right, we're going to move on to something that isn't directly football-related, but it relates to the ongoing prosecution of Patriots owner Robert Kraft on misdemeanor counts of solicitation of prostitution in Florida. One of the realities that has emerged from this mess, as Kraft and his lawyers have fought this surveillance video that allegedly shows Robert Kraft engaged in sexual activities at the Orchids of Asia Day Spa in Jupiter, Florida. One of the things that's happened is more attention has been paid to this practice of sneak and peek surveillance, where police officers and police departments use cameras in these rooms spying on people in order to catch prostitution in the act. The problem is you also catch innocent people who actually are getting massages and only massages. You have video of someone taking off their clothes, getting a massage, 
putting their clothes on, a very sensitive area where we don't want to be videotaped. And we already have now one class action that was filed in April arising from the five-day window when the cameras were present at the Orchids of Asia Day Spa in Jupiter, Florida. There's one individual who is filing on behalf of everyone else who was in this same situation. Apparently more than 30 at least were there to get massages and nothing more. They were videotaped. No restrictions apparently on the videotape. The video still exists under Florida's open records laws. Those videos may have to be released to the public even though they show nothing wrong. Look, th th this and, and Robert Kraft isn't fighting this as part of a greater good, but there's a greater good that's being serviced here because people are having their privacy rights apparently violated by law enforcement and it needs to stop. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, yeah, doctor's office, um, getting a massage. There are plenty of areas where we aren't at home and we are in a state of undress that we would rather not people see. And they are spying on people who aren't doing anything wrong in those areas. And the bottom line is that needs to stop. And the only way you make it stop is through the court system and civil lawsuits. People, oh, we need tort reform and there are too many lawsuits. Lawsuits change behavior by organizations and corporations faster than anything else. Because when you get hit with a huge verdict for something that you did that violated legal standards, you stop violating the legal standards. And this is good that uh, this fight has brought to light something that that uh, did result, apparently, in the rights of innocent people being violated. Chris. Yeah, it just doesn't seem right at a base level. You know, again, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, oh, oh, great. And what do we see with these tapes more times than not? They do some way, somehow, some way, find their way to the light of the public. And like you said, yeah, you're going to have innocent people there who's going to, you know, have their butt and wiener on, you know, the TV and computer screens. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's PFTOT. I'm allowed to say that. They're going to be all <laughs> over the Internet, and they're going to be like, what the hell? I went there to get a massage and now I'm going to get, you know, blasted about what I look like naked in a private setting. You know, yeah, privacy rights are real. And if you start to let law enforcement do this and where does it ever end? I mean, you know, oh gosh, they're going to have they put cameras everywhere. I mean, so yeah, it just doesn't seem right from that aspect. I understand people not being happy about it. Uh, and I feel, hey, listen, it's unfortunate for Mr. Kraft too. You know, again, he's a guy that I, I think is you know, kind of getting the, the taste of what it's like to be almost a, an athlete where you get singled out because you're famous and a big popular, you know, figure in our country and they're attacking him when there was other people at wrong here. And then, of course, there's a lot of other issues with this case altogether. Yeah. And and, uh, you know, I, I think what happened is law enforcement in Florida ended up catching a fish too big for them to deal with because. Robert Kraft is motivated to fight this yep. and he's fighting it and it's bringing things to light that are going to cause problems in Florida and maybe elsewhere. But that's good because to the extent that this crap is going on, it needs to stop. It needs to end. There are other ways to catch prostitutes. There are other ways to catch people who would solicitate or solicit prostitution yeah. and, and, and violating the rights of innocent people by videotaping them while you know butts and wieners <laughs> I mean, you, you don't nobody wants that to be shown and nobody right. wants to see that so all right on, yeah. on that uh on, on that note uh i can't think of any other way to end it so let's just end it chris great work as always a fun day it flies by hopefully it flew by for you who are out there paying attention to pft live and pftot we'll be back tomorrow with another edition of PFT Live and PFT PFTOT, check us out all day long at ProFootballTalk.com. Chris, have a great day, buddy. You too, buddy. See you, man.